Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome once again to another virtual Bible class, virtual uh, Bible class of the New Hope Baptist Church uh, coming to you from Covington, Georgia. We thank God for all of you who are listening and viewing live and those of you who will be listening and viewing uh, later on through Facebook uh, live streams, rebroadcast on other pages and on YouTube. We thank God for each and every one of you. Well, listen, it's August the 11th, year of our Lord, 2021. We thank God for another opportunity to come to you tonight with another exciting virtual Bible class. We've been doing these now for over 16 months, and God has really been blessing. We just thank God for this privilege and opportunity to still connect with you. Uh, by means of this virtual platform. Now, we have gone back into the uh, sanctuary for Sunday services. And uh, we just want to remind you that as we do that, uh, services for one hour, one hour, we in and out in an hour, we encourage you, wear your mask, masks are required. Uh, temperature checks are at the door. Check your temperature. If you're feeling ill or sick, please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, do not come. We want to keep the environment as safe as possible. And uh, that's basically it. Now, here's a new thing. We've been praying about this. Starting this coming Sunday, which will be, uh, I believe, the 15th, uh, the third Sunday in August, we will be uh, broadcasting Facebook live stream. We'll be doing our 11 o'clock service um, in person, and we'll be simultaneously broadcasting Facebook live stream. So we prayed about it. We thought about doing a different virtual platform, uh, but it's just so much involved. So we're going to do it this way for a while, see how things are going. Um, so starting Sunday, it's coming Sunday, uh, we will broadcast the service also on Facebook in addition to being there in the sanctuary. So just wanted to let you know that. Um, so let's see. Well, listen, last Sunday was my birthday, August the 8th. And I want to thank all of you for your greetings 
on Facebook. Uh, those of you who sent uh, uh, cards and letters and cash apps, and checks and whatever, we just thank you so much uh, for thinking of us. Uh, and we just praise God for each and every one of you. Well, listen, uh, as we pray tonight, we want to remind you that uh, each Thursday, each Thursday, as we have been doing for, for over a year now, each Thursday at 7 p.m. is a New Hope Baptist Church prayer line. It's a New Hope Baptist Church prayer line. It's every Thursday from 7 o'clock until 7.30 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. Again, New Hope Baptist Church prayer line every Thursday night from 7 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that number to call is 774-220-4020. Again, 774-220-4020. Four zero two zero, and we want to encourage you to call and just share in the prayer line. The access code is three seven two one one three seven, followed by the pound sign. So if you call that number, you'll be able to uh, participate in the prayer line, whether you want to listen in or, or whatever. You know, we encourage you to call and share in the prayer line. Listen tonight, we're praying. As you know, uh, there has been a rise, a dramatic rise in the number of COVID cases because of this new Delta variant and the low vaccination rate. From what I understand now, people are beginning to, more and more people are beginning to be vaccinated and hopefully that trend will continue. But let's keep praying because this Delta variant is, uh, from what I'm understanding, is more deadly than the original variant. And so we need to make sure that uh, we are protected. Let's pray for our school children. Uh, they're going to school and there have been numerous cases here in Newton County uh, where kids have gotten sick with COVID and many more kids are in quarantine. And it's happening all across the nation. So let's, let's keep praying. Let's pray for our, 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 <laughs> our neighbors down in Florida. Listen, let's, let's pray. Let's lift up. Let's lift up in prayer. Whole state of Florida, whole state of Texas, and all these other places that, that are just, you know, uh, restricting or disallowing mass. Let's pray that God will touch their heart. And that they'll understand that this, this COVID-19 is no joke. People are dying every day. Day. People are getting sick every day. I've read stories after story after story where families, whole families, have been wiped out by this virus. You know, the original, the original strain was 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 dealing primarily with elderly people, people with uh, immune deficiency. But this new variant is taking out young people, taking out children, and so. Uh, we need to be prayerful. So, listen, continue to, to, to you know, practice the social distancing. Do what you need to do. Do your part uh, so we can get over this uh, pandemic. We're praying. I believe I believe the name is Greg Gregory Gibbs. We're praying for him. We're praying for others. Um, the Lackey family still on the prayer list. Uh, Demond Lackey was funeralized. I believe that was last Sunday uh, at the Sims Chapel Baptist Church. Uh, he was funeralized. That's the son of uh, Brother Lester, Lester Lackey, the owner of Lackey and Sons Funeral Home. And so we're lifting uh, Brother Lester and Sister uh, Constance and wife up in our prayers as they continue to deal uh, with the passing of their son, Demond. And there are not a lot of other people that are going through bereavement. We're lifting them up as well. If there ever was a time, when the church needs to be praying, that time is right now. Well, listen, we have an exciting class for you tonight, a study for tonight. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And then we're going to go right into the lesson for tonight. Let's pray. 
Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, even for right now. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege and this opportunity to come to you one more time. And we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, that you've been so good to us. You watched over us and kept us from all her harm and danger. God, as we come tonight, we are lifting up those who stand in the need of prayer. There are many who are suffering uh, from the virus. So it says, Lord, that there are others who are suffering, who are being turned away from the hospital because there's just no room. We just pray, God, that you just take hold of the reins of our minds that we might do the things we need to do to contribute to the health and, and wholeness and healing of everyone. We lift up those families that are bereaved tonight. Lord, we lift up the lackey family. We lift up the countless families of God who have lost loved ones as a result of this virus. And those who've lost loved ones in, in other cases. Father, we know, God, that you are uh, the comforter. Pray, oh God, you just comfort them right now as only you can. Now, Lord, give us a spirit of revelation and spirit of understanding as we seek to hear your word. Let us hear what the spirit is saying to the church. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. I forgot to mention earlier too, our own brother Marvin Clements in the hospital. And so we're lifting him up as well in our prayers. It's brother Marvin Clements, he's been in the hospital. So we're lifting him up in our prayers that God will just touch his body and bring healing unto him. Well, listen, as we said earlier tonight, our lesson tonight is we're going to be talking about a biblical theology of sex, a biblical theology of sex. We're going to be talking about what the Bible says, what the Bible says about sexual intercourse, a biblical theology of sex, what the Bible says about sexual intercourse. So uh, it's going to be an interesting topic, and we just pray and hope that uh, we'll learn something and that uh, our lives will be enriched uh, from this Bible study. So let's dive into it. Many parents eventually get around to having the, the talk. Uh, and when we talk about the talk, we talk about the talk we have with our children. Which we, they talk about uh, changes in their body as they go through uh, puberty. And the young ladies, young girls uh, have their first period, their first menstruation cycle. And uh, so they talk about that, talk about where babies come from. I remember when I was when I was in school before my mom. <laughs> well, I don't even know if my mom had that talk with me because, you know, back in the day when I came up, you know, uh, parents just didn't talk about things like that. Uh, but uh, I had some issues when I was in school. Uh, I got in a fight with a young man, little boy, because uh, we got in an argument about where babies come from. He was saying, he said one thing and I was saying one another thing. And for that was based on what my mother told me. I was basing my opinion on what my mama told me about where babies come from. Of course, both of us were wrong looking back on it, but uh, we just went by what our parents told us. Uh, we didn't we didn't have the serious talk back then. We just had to, you know, just told us something to get rid of us. Uh, so we talk about the birds and the bees, and uh, talk about sexually transmitted diseases or STDs. So eventually, uh, parents should have this talk with their children. However, most parents do not talk to their 
Christian children about a biblical theology of sex. And the reason why they don't have that talk is because really they don't really know what the Bible says about sex, except for the commandment to abstain and not have sex until marriage. But I want to share with you tonight that the Bible has much more to say about sex than just abstaining until marriage. You see, in most Christian settings, including the church, uh, sex is a taboo subject. You don't like to talk about it. It's a hush-hush, under-the-rug type deal. You don't talk about it. And therefore, uh, most, learn about, most of our children learn about sex from the streets, or they learn from the media. Uh, and uh, these days they're learning from the uh, secular, crazy Christian education classes that they're having in school. Or they learn from their friends or peers. And none of the above sources, the streets, the media, or their friends and peers, none of them have any idea of, a biblical, of the biblical theology of sex. Parents don't know, mostly. Street does, definitely doesn't know. Media doesn't know, doesn't care. And neither their friends or their peers. So they've not, they've not had that talk about the biblical theology of sex. And I dare say that many of you who are listening to them to this right now have not have, have no idea. Uh, what the Bible says about sex and sexual intercourse, with the exception uh, that we are to abstain uh, until marriage and that sexual intercourse should be confined within uh, the marriage situation. So what does the Bible say? Well, before we get into specifics, we must remember this, that when the Lord God finished creating the world. The Bible says everything God made was good, and that included sex. Now, I've even heard some crazy, you know, uh, back in the day, I've heard that uh, 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 a woman's desire for a husband came as a result of the fall. No, uh, sexual intercourse, sex was part of the plan before the fall. Sex is not part of Sex does not result, was not a result of the fall. That was in the beginning. Uh, and as far as that woman's desire toward her man, uh, that's a whole nother subject that, that many people have misinterpreted. And that's another Bible lesson for another day. Here's what the Bible says. And we go back to that cornerstone passage of Genesis chapter one, verses uh, 27 and 28. But beginning at verse 26, uh, that, that passage is, is, is the cornerstone of human creation. But let's start at, 20, at 27. It says, so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And that's from uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. As I said earlier, that beginning at verse 26, that passage, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, is the cornerstone package. If, 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 you can, if you can get that passage in your mind, in your spirit, in your understanding, that tells you what this life is all about. Here again, this is part of it, verses 27 and 28. So let's let's uh, look at some chronological points before we unpack this. And as we do this, we need to understand the relationship 
between Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. You see, Genesis 1 is the account of what God did. Genesis 2 is the account of how God did what he did. So you got to understand that Genesis 1 and 2 run concurrent. Genesis 1 tells us what God did. Genesis 2 tells us how God did it. And I'm sharing that because the commandment to be fruitful and multiply that's found in, that we just read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 28, it occurs chronologically after the creation of Eve in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 and uh, 21 through 23. So again, it's in chapter one, but it occurs after what happened in chapter two. Because again, Genesis one tells us what God did. Genesis two shares with us how God uh, did it. So let's look at some of the finer points. Look at the finer points of the creation of man and woman. Note, first of all, that God created man, that is the species of man, okay? He created man, the species, the human species. He created them, uh, man as male and female. Male and female. God's original intent. Now, in the beginning, woman came from man because as we, as we read the creation of Eve, God causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam. He performs an operation and Eve is constructed from Adam's you know, midsection, the rib, okay? So the first woman came from man. But after that, the natural order of procreation, men came from women, okay? And uh, that word woman is, is, is a, comes from the combination womb man, womb man, womb. Woman has a womb that differentiates her from, from the male. The female has a womb. The female is the womb man, the woman. Okay, now man and woman were created to complement one another. Okay, and that word complement means to, to, you know, I have something that I'm missing. The woman, the women have something they're missing. Men have something they're missing. And they, and they were created to fulfill what was missing in each other. And they were created to complement one another physically, uh, psychologically, and spiritually. Now, remember, we just talked about that God gave man, gave them, man and woman, the dominion mandate. Part of that mandate was to be fruitful multiply and to fill the earth. So therefore, in order to do that, the union, the sexual union between man and woman was necessary to fulfill the commandment to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth. The woman couldn't do it by herself. Man couldn't do it by himself. They could only do it by joining together. And that brings us to the mystery of the sexual union. The mystery of the sexual union. Note now in the beginning that woman was taken out of man. Also interesting to note that God did not create woman in the same manner that God created man. 
and, and, and that's that's you know god could have he could have formed adam out of the dust of the ground as he did he could have also perhaps formed eve out of the dust of the ground but but he did not form eve that way he formed eve from adam that's a theological point there he, he's he's, he's He's emphasizing the point that we are part of one another. We are meant to be together, man and woman. Okay? So, sexual intercourse. When a man unites sexually with a woman, in a sense, that which was separate is made whole again. They become one. They become one. And that mystery is deep and even further because from that reunion or from that union where the two become one, another one is produced. That is the baby is produced. You know, say we have 46 chromosomes, 23 from our father. 23 from our mother. Okay. So you are you are in essence part woman, part man. Because it took a woman and man to make you. So that's that's the mystery of the sexual union. So we get to that first sexual union. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 4. Verse one says, now Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bore Cain. And throughout the Bible, that term knew, K-N-E-W, is often used, it's a euphemism, is often used to denote sexual intercourse. It denotes intimacy, not just you know, not just head knowledge, it's talking about carnal knowledge. Now, while it's not specifically stated, it is obvious now that the sex drive was part of God's good creation, as well as the emotional attachment that accompanies the sexual relationship. And while sexual attraction, love, that is the emotional attachment, were obviously present, the primary purpose, I'm talking about God, I'm talking about originally with Adam and Eve, the primary purpose of the sexual union was to produce offspring through procreation. Remember, they're fulfilling the commandment, be fruitful and fill the earth. So, originally, God's intent, man and woman, join together and produce offspring, okay? What, this is what uh, the Bible talks about in this commentary verse in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Which says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast, King James says, cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, key in on that one flesh, because that's what it's all about. That's the mystery of the sexual union, one flesh. So it was God's original intent for a man and a woman to be in a lifetime marital union because of the mystery of the sexual intercourse. And in that union, through that sexual union, the two become one flesh. I'll say that again. It was God's original intent for a man 
and a woman. One man, one woman to have a sexual union, be involved in a covenant relationship that spans both of their lifetimes. So therefore, at some level, the act of sexual intercourse makes a man and a woman one. Didn't say marriage. I said sexual intercourse. The act of sexual intercourse at some level makes a man and a woman one. And that's why, that's why I just said that. A man and a woman were intended uh, to be one with only one. You see, divorce, sexual unions with more than one person was not God's original intent. God's original intent uh, for sex to be a sexual, a, a sacred act between two people and only those two for a lifetime. Divorce, sexual union with other people were not part of God's original intent. In fact, talk about that in the uh, uh, one of the passages where he was talking about divorce. And I believe it was Jesus who said that it, it was because of the hardness. God allowed divorce because of the hardness of man's heart. But divorce and sexual union with other people were not part of God's original intent. Now, Some of you might remember R. Kelly. R. Kelly, R. Kelly, he's been in the news uh, a couple of years, the past couple of years uh, for some stuff he's been doing. And I believe he's currently in jail now. But back in 1993, R. Kelly released a song called Bump and Grind. And in that song, he repeatedly stated, I don't see nothing wrong with a little bump and grind. Of course, you know, he's using that, that terminology, bump and grind, as a euphemism for the act of sexual intercourse. I want to suggest to you that R. Kelly was wrong because there's so much more to sexual intercourse than most people realize. So much more to sexual intercourse than most people realize, even Christians. Is more to it than we realize. So let's look at this more of sexual intercourse. Number one, it is more than just a physical activity. You know, we live in an age of sexual freedom today, and, and uh, people just look at sex as recreation and exercise, you know, uh, you know. And they treat it as if they can get involved with people sexually, no strings attached. You know, they got this term friends with benefits, you know, no strings attached, no emotional strings attached, nothing attached. That's a myth. That is a myth. You cannot have sexual intercourse with a person without some other form of attachment. That's just part of the package. And we deceive ourselves. And they're thinking that uh, it, it can be something just can be done and just easily walk away uh, because that's not the case. It's not just a physical activity. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul says. He's writing to the church of Corinth. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. Now, this is coming from the uh, Christian Standard Bible, the 2017 edition. Paul says, food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. 
Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So should I take a part of Christ's body and make it part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? Well, the scripture says the two will become one flesh, that everyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Please sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Let's unpack this. He says the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. And let me just say this too, because you know, uh, when when I was when I was coming along as a young Christian, and I still hear traces of this even today, it seems to be a belief in the church that God is not really concerned about our body. You, you hear this re, in reflected in language that talks about Jesus uh, coming and Jesus dying on the cross to save our soul. And it seems to imply in that language that the only thing that's important to God is the, or the, is the soulish or the spiritual aspect of us. But that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, when we when we when we use that, when we say that that Jesus came and died to save our souls, the Bible never says that. You see, because when you see the word soul, most of the time when you see the word soul in the Bible, it is not referring to just the spiritual part, it is referring to the whole person. This, this division of, 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 of spirit and body and soul and body, that's a Greek division. That, that, was not, that was not a division that was prominent in Hebrew thought. In the Bible is a Hebrew book. The Jews didn't think that way. Uh, the Jews, you know, they thought of soul when you, when you read in Ezekiel back in the Old Testament where it says the soul that sinned, it, it shall die. It wasn't, he wasn't talking about just the, the spiritual part. He was talking about the whole person. See, they, they, they did not divide humanity. That's a Greek thought. That was not Hebrew thought. So the Lord is concerned with our bodies so much so that one day these bodies, these very bodies that we have now will be transformed, changed, and be raised will be raised. So the body is not just a temporary earthly house for the soul or spirit. Uh, our bodies are integral and inseparable, inseparable element of who we are. In fact, uh, without our bodies, we could have no earthly existence. Because remember, and, and this is why that, 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 that verse we were talking about, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, that's why it's so important. He says, let us make man in our image. He created them male and female. But listen, the point I'm trying to make is that God made or created man to dwell on earth, not heaven. Heaven 
where our beloved loved ones are now was not part of God's original plan for our habitation. He created us as a combination of spirit and body to live on earth forever. As you see, death was not part of God originally. So we were created from earth for earth, not heaven. Therefore, our bodies are of vital importance because without our bodies, we cannot fulfill what God created us to fulfill. He did not create us to inhabit the spiritual realm where he, where he, where he dwelled. He created us to inhabit the physical realm. So our bodies are an integral part of who we are. So much so that one day the body will be resurrected. See, we will not spend eternity in a disembodied state. We'll spend eternity in our glorified bodies on the new earth. Revelation chapter 21. Our loved ones, Paul said to be absent from the body, he is to be present with the Lord. The Bible also says in his presence is the fullness of joy. Okay. But I want to suggest to you that they are not complete. Because they are, their spirits are with God, but their bodies are decaying in the grave. And one day, when Jesus comes, he's going to bring their spirits with him. And then he's going to reunite their spirits with their bodies that will be changed and glorified. And they will forever be with the Lord in our glorified bodies to dwell on the new earth. In the, in the new earth. That's the plan. All, wants, all God wants to do, this whole salvation, salvific issue is all about redemption. And redemption means getting back what was lost. Heaven was not lost. Dominion was lost. We did not come from heaven. We were created to live on earth. So our bodies are vital to us. So we need to get that theology straight. Because, you know, there are some people that, who think it doesn't matter what, what happens to my body, just since my soul is right. No, that's, you're going to have to give an account for the things you do with your body, in this body. Because that's part of who you are. He says, verse 15, don't you know that your bodies, not your spirits now, he says, you talk about your bodies. He says, don't you know your bodies are a part of Christ's body? See, according to the Apostle Paul, our bodies, not just our spirits and souls, our bodies are a part of Christ's body. You see, because it is only through our bodies that God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit acts in the physical world you know i, I you know I, i've got to the point where i cringe now whenever i hear somebody praying and sending god to the hospital and sending god here and sending god there and go by and see sister so and so and go by and do this no 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 that's why we're here we are to go in his name so when we go in his name and by the power of his spirit when we go he has gone. Because when God feeds the hungry, when God clothes the naked, when God visits the sick, God uses us, our bodies, to do it. That's why it's important that we take care of our bodies. 
because this is and and I've I've run across people, uh, Christians, who neglect totally neglect their bodies because they say, well, you know, I'm going I'm going to be with the Lord. No, well, yes, you'll go be, you'll go be with the Lord, but the Lord has a work for you to do, and uh, you'll do you'll you you will do more good for God living on earth than dying and going to heaven. Because when you die and go to heaven, uh, you'll be in a state in his presence, but you'll be in a state of waiting until the resurrection, resting for the resurrection. The devil wants you out of here, but God doesn't. We talked about John 17 not too long ago. In that in 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 the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed. He said, Lord, I pray that you don't take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So our bodies are vitally important. You gotta understand that in the sexual act is more than just the two of you. This is what Paul said. He's asking some rhetorical questions. And the questions he's asking, he, he, he expects a no. He says, should I take a part of Christ's body, which is your physical body, and make it part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For well, the scripture says the two will become one flesh. Now don't let don't let that word prostitute throw you off. It, it's not just a matter of a, of a prostitute. It's any person that we have sexual intercourse with, we become one with that person. Paul is saying. Since our body, that is the body of the believer, is part of Christ's body, when we engage in illicit sexual intercourse outside of marriage, we unite a part of Christ's body to an illegitimate or in an illegitimate union. So in addition to that, we become one flesh with our illegitimate partner. Now here's the thing. He says here, verse 17, he says, but anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. But you can't join with the Lord physically because he's spirit. So he says, but anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. See, Paul makes a contrast between being one body with a prostitute and being one spirit with the Lord. But let me throw a wrinkle in that. Aren't we, aren't we spirits also? You know, I chuckle sometimes because I hear people say, well, you know, I'm not a spiritual person. Everybody is a spiritual person because everybody is a spirit living in a body. To deny you a spiritual person is to deny you, you exist because we were created as spirits to live in a physical body. So in a sense, all, are, all have all of us have spirituality. We just don't recognize it. Don't tap into it, don't use it. Or we use it illegitimately because we are spirit. Now here's my point. If that is the case, and it is, then I would not think it would be too far of a stretch to think of the sexual union 
in terms of a spiritual union as well. In fact, the Bible, the Bible seems to, to give some kind of a um, um, parallel with this. There, there, there's a, there's a uh, incident in the Old Testament. I think it's around about the 25th chapter of Numbers where the, the daughters of, of, of Moab entice Israel uh, into a sexual uh, liaison, liaison. They had sexual intercourse. Men of Israel had sexual intercourse with the daughters of Moab. And at, in a result of that sexual intercourse, they also enticed them to serve their gods. So there, there's, a, there's a spiritual aspect of sex as well. Not just physical, not just emotion. It's also spiritual. Could it be that maybe the reason why some of us are discombobulated is because we've been joined with too many people and it's called spiritual confusion. It's transference of spirits. Hmm. See, that's why God intended the original couple in us be joined in body, mind, and spirit. So therefore, in view of that, I would suggest that sexual intercourse is not just a physical interaction, but there is a psychological and spiritual co-mingling that occurs as well. You're not just, you're not just swapping fluids. There's a psychological and spiritual commingling going on as well. See, sex is the most intimate act. He says here in verse 18, he says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. You see, sexual immorality is a sin against the body because it perverts God's intention for the body to be used as a vehicle of physical, emotional, and spiritual intimacy with only one person in the marital relationship. In a sense, the act of sexual intercourse is the giving and receiving of mind, soul, and body. The greatest gift is to give to one another. And once you give that gift, you can't get it back. Now, I'm sure you 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 experienced or heard of cases where people have been one way in a relationship, but once once a a sexual act occurs, it changes the whole dynamics of the relationship. Never the same before. That's because there's a there's an emotional. Psychological, not only just physical, but emotional, psychological, and yes, even spiritual transaction that has occurred that cannot be reversed. Because in the sexual act, the partners become one and a part of each other or one another. And now, for some of us, it's more drastic than others, but the truth of the matter is based upon this biblical principle, you are one and you are a part of every person you've ever had sex with. See, we, 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 we cheapen and degrade ourselves when we make ourselves one with and part of multiple people. 
Because that was not God's original intent. That messes us up. Emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, in many cases physically, with diseases and other things. Now here's another one. This is a whammy. This is a whammy here. He says in verse 19, he says, Don't you know that your body is the temple? of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? That's your question. Would you have an illicit sexual intercourse if you knew that God was physically present in the room? You knew that God was watching you physically. He's sitting over there in the chair watching you. Would you? Would you, if, if your mother was sitting over there or your father or someone else you, you, you respected, would you? Well, according to Apostle Paul, according to Apostle Paul in this verse, our bodies, that is the body of the believer, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God. God is in us through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, God literally is in the room <laughs> when we have illicit sexual intercourse. Another interesting thing about that verse is that the Greek word that is translated as temple is a word that denotes the inner sanctuary of the temple. You, you might not know this, but when you in the New Testament, when you uh, when you run across the English word temple, all the time is not the same Greek word that's behind it. There are two words, two two Greek words that denote temple in the New Testament. There's a word called uh, 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 arios, arios. I, I, I think the English transliteration is uh, E-I or I-E-R-O-S, something like that. Uh, but that denotes the temple complex. That denotes the buildings, the outer core. And then there's another term called naos. And the naos is the inner sanctuary uh, in, in the pagan temples. The naos denoted the seat of the God or the dwelling place of the God. And this is the word that's used for temple in this verse. Our bodies, our body is the dwelling place of God, the Holy Spirit. And that term also denotes the, 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 the altar, the Holy of Holies, the most sacred part of the temple, the part where the priest only went in uh, only once a year, where God resides, the holy place, the place where the glory of the Spirit of God resides. That's us. That's us. One of the reasons why Jesus didn't put so much emphasis on the temple. You know, he cleansed it because I think he was trying to bring, uh, orient, orientate us to the theological point that God no longer dwells primarily in temples of stone, but he dwells in temples of flesh, our body. So he doesn't leave the room. Paul says in verse 19, C through 20, he says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price, he said. Therefore, King James, so in this particular passage, uh, version, so glorify God with your body. 
You are to glorify God, not just with your spirit. You are to glorify God with your body. Now, this, this is an issue that most American Christians have real problems with. We have real problems with this biblical reality. And that reality is this. We don't own anything. We don't even own ourselves. We, 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 we run around, we talk about my money, uh, debate with the abortion issue. It, it keeps the way, you know, I got a woman has the right to do with her body or whatever. According to the Bible, it's not her body, it's the Lord. It's not my body, it's the Lord. I don't belong to me. You don't belong to yourself. Okay? We belong to the Lord. And if we are Christians, we're doubly bought. That, as a Christian, that ought to be the last thing that comes out of our mouth. Because number one, we belong to God by right of creation. The earth is the Lord in the fullness thereof, the world and all they that dwell therein. That's what the psalmist says. Plus, if you are saved, you've been bought with a price, and that price being the precious blood of Jesus on Calvary's cross. You twice bought. And so we don't own our body. So we don't have a right to do with our bodies what we want to do. We don't own our, we don't own the money in our pockets or purses or accounts. We don't own anything. Listen, you think you own something? I dare you. I double dog dare you. You think you own something, just mess around and die. See what happens to it. See what happens to your ownership after you die. You can't take it with you. When you die, somebody else can be driving what you thought, what you used to call your car. Somebody else be living in what you used to call your house. And if he's, she's pretty enough or he's handsome enough, when you die, somebody else may be married to your husband or your wife. We don't own nothing. So the operative word in the kingdom of God is not ownership, but stewardship. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, he says, moreover, it is required of a student, of a steward, rather, that they be found faithful. And the word faithful means reliable, true, loyal. Because we've been bought with a price. We've been bought, lock, stock, and barrel, the whole caboodle. It all belongs to him. So it's really salvation plus. And what I mean by that, is that most Christians, we, we, we readily accept the fact and we praise God for the fact of Jesus dying and paying the penalty or cost of salvation on the cross. But oftentimes we fail to realize or we fail to understand that we're included in the deal. See, when Jesus paid the penalty for our sin or when he paid the penalty for sin, he didn't pay for us to be free to ourselves. That's a that's a misconception. You know, Paul talks about this in in uh, in, in Colossians chapter one, verse thirteen, I believe, where he talks about the fact that we have been we have been transferred, we've been rescued from the kingdom or the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And here's the point, here's the point I'm getting at. No man is absolutely free. We are either servants of sin 
or we're servants of righteousness. See, before we got saved, we were servants of sin. Now, God did not save us. He did not send Jesus to save us. He did not send Jesus to pay the penalty for our, our sin, for us to be free to ourselves. No, he, he, he did that so that he could rescue us from being slaves of sin so that we might be servants of righteousness. There's no middle ground. You can't, you can't de de declare uh, that you, that you are, you know, you, you know, you're not going to take one side or the other. He says, you're either for me or against me. <laughs> See. So we, we either serving, we either servants of sin or we're servants of righteousness. And I think uh, one of the things that, that happens is that we, we, we grow up with this erroneous theology. At least I knew I did. You know, I used to think when I was, a, you know, a growing up in the church, I used to think I, I lived in neutral territory. And my life was about, uh, before I died, you know, I had Satan on one side and God on, on the other side. And, and what, what needed to happen before I died, I need to pick which side I was going to be on. As if I was in neutral territory. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says I was born in sin. I was born a slave to sin. I was born under the, the, the domain of darkness. And what God did through Jesus, he reached in the dominion of darkness and snatched me out of the burning fire. But he snatched me out of the burning fire so that I might be saved do his will. Not my own thing, but to do his will. So let's conclude. Hopefully, hopefully now, this study has helped us to begin to understand the gravity of sexual sin. And we need this more so now than ever because we're living in a world that's just saturated with sexual immorality. It's all around us on the TV, it's every, every, uh, the songs everywhere. Free sex is just promoted, 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 promoted. And it's not just a physical thing. I, I think this is satanic and demonically inspired because the devil knows the spiritual aspect of sexual intercourse. He knows there's a transfer of spirits going on. He knows that. And let me tell you something. If I had learned what we, what we discussed tonight, if I had learned this as a young teenage believer, it would have saved me a lot of grief and pain from the foolish mistakes I made because of ignorance. You see, the point is we must all remember, going back to Genesis 1, 26 and 28, we must all remember we've been given dominion. And that includes dominion over our sexual self. Paul talked about this in in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, he says, he says, I, I, you know, I have to discipline my body. Lest after I preach, I myself is a castaway. Your body has to be disciplined. And we must control our bodies instead of allowing our bodies to control us. And that's not just sex. That's food. That's a lot of other stuff. You know, we, we got to exercise discipline over our body. Because if we're honest, if we're honest, for most of us, myself included, this study is somewhat too late. We've long ago defiled our sexual purity and dedication to just one part. We've long ago uh, been involved with, so, with other people and compromised 
not just our sexuality, but our spirituality by commingling uh, with the spirits of others who are not necessarily of the Lord. Because if they were of the Lord, they wouldn't be commingling spirits with us. <laughs> okay? So it's a little late for most of us as far as sexual purity is concerned. Uh, but thank God for his grace. Thank God for his grace. Uh, because this can help us to understand what's been going on. And, and we can repent. We can start right where we are. Uh, to be faithful and giving him the glory and the honor that he's due in our sexual conduct. Praise God tonight. I hope and pray that um, this uh, lesson has been a blessing to you. And listen, if it's been a blessing to you. It'll be a blessing to someone else. Share it on your timeline. Uh, let others know what you've been learning. And uh, continue to pray for us that God will continue to inspire us and, and give us revelation into his word. So that we might bring, continue to bring you a thoughtful and stimulating uh, virtual Bible study. I don't want to just bring stuff that 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 you know that's 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 readily available. I want to bring help you to grow deeper in your walk, and closer in your walk with the Lord. Remember now, we'll be back. We're back in the sanctuary now. It's 11 a.m. One hour service. 11 a.m. Uh, on Sunday, starting this Sunday, we'll be broadcasting virtually as well. Hope to see you tomorrow night if you can call into the prayer line. But in the meantime, uh, it is our prayer that God will bless you real good. Until the next time, may your joy be forever in the Lord. Have a good one.